Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike and your host, and this is part two of our interview with former Buccaneer pilot Tom Eels. In this episode, Tom chats about what it was like to fly and operate from the carrier, his ejection in 1970, moving on to the RAF Buccaneers, and he rounds it up by answering some of our patrons' questions and some personal questions from myself. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. So can you talk us through the cockpit as well? I'm guessing it was all uh, steam gauges back then. All analog steam gauges. Uh, the basic idea behind the Buccaneer was that its principal flight instrument system was the integrated flight instrument system, whereby you had uh, an air data computer that fed uh, all the air data to the height and rate of climb display, altimeter and vertical speed, uh, the indicated airspeed and mark number display, which was a strip bit like a an early Ford motor car strip speed. Had on the lightning as yeah. well. Yes, yeah. exactly yeah. the same in the lightning. Uh, attitude and compass uh, information were on two big roller blind displays in front of you, driven by uh, a master reference gyro, uh, which provided aircraft attitude and navigational information. TACAN, the navigation aid for the pilot, basically, mm -hmm. could be overlaid onto the onto the navigation display. That was the, the, the core of the instrumentation, but of course, as you can imagine, all around the sides was a mass of bits and pieces. And of course, every time another modification came along, something else was tacked on. The first big modification was that the Navy pilots, when they went to the deck for the first time, said, oh, we don't like this strip speed, nothing like us, not nearly accurate enough. So they put a more accurate two-needle airspeed indicator up here on the left-hand side, uh, just beside the head-up display. Uh, then we had the blow pressure gauges and bits and pieces proliferated. So frankly, by the 1990s, nearly 30 years later, the cockpit could best be described as an ergonomic slum. I've heard that before. <laughs> was it roomy or was it comfortable? Uh, funnily enough, it, it was roomy enough, yes. It was, it was quite tight round here. The ejection seat was, was quite, everything was quite tight, but there was plenty of room and you could motor the seat up and down and the pilot had very good visibility mm -hmm. from the front. Likewise, the nav. The two seats were slightly offset. Okay. Pilot slightly to the left, nav slightly to the right, and the navs was that much higher. So in the back seat, you actually got a very good view. Because it didn't look like it from. Didn't like look like it, but it was it. just a small amount. Yeah. It was just enough to give a good view from the back. All right. So can you tell us what air ships you flew on? What ships? Yeah, you flew. On. Victorious, principally. Uh, then Hermes for a while, uh, but that was the time when Victorious which had caught fire in the dockyard, they decided not to, uh, not to restore her and she was scrapped. So 801 Squadron went down to, from nine to six aircraft. Mm. Uh, and that was the time really when the Navy said, well, thank you very much for your, your help on loan, but we really don't need you any longer because the squadron's got that much smaller. So I'm at a loose end, where do I go now? Yeah. And it follows on to the, the rest of my Navy experience. It was just at the time when the decision was taken to put the Buccaneer into service with the Air Force. So there was a, a need to get people trained up as quickly as possible. Uh, I was sent off to become a flying instructor. I learned to fly uh, the NAT as a, as a QFI, did a short time at Valley, three and a half months. And then I found myself sent back to Lossiemouth, this time as a member of the small RAF staff on the training squadron up there, specifically to uh, assist in training the first two years worth of RAF pilots and NAVs who were going onto the Buccaneer. Uh, well, we also flew with the Navy just as much as we flew with the Air Force up there. Okay. Uh, the Mark I Buccaneer, which had been retired by now, we're talking 1969, they had to drag about six Mark I Buccaneers out of the shed and get them going again uh, because of the increased training task which the Royal Air Force had placed upon the squadron. So uh, we flew both the Mark I and the Mark II uh, together. Uh, I did lots of uh, backseat rides, uh, the scary FAM-1 as we called them, Fam the scary FAM-1s for <laughs> Navy and RAF pilots uh, throughout my two years back with the Navy. Uh, I did bounce off Ark Royal a couple of times but 
by and large, uh, because I was never going to go back to sea again, I didn't, one, did, one couldn't keep current in deck landing, frankly. Yeah, of course. But you had a pretty uneventful day, didn't you, one day in the Buccaneer? Could you tell us about this? Yes. <laughs> I think we've already alluded to the fact yeah. that the Mark 1's engines were pretty unreliable. Um, there was one of these Mark 1's which the engineers had spent weeks trying to get serviceable. And eventually they produced it on the flight line and said, there you go, take it away, go and fly it. Uh, and it just so happened that um, I was with a young RAF first tour pilot on his first trip. Uh, we had a bit of problem on the runway to start with when the left Gyron Jr. refused to run up to full power and kept surging and stalling. Eventually we managed to get it up to full power, so off we went on our, on our first ever flight. Come back to the circuit and unsurprisingly, uh, they didn't always get it right first time round. Um, so we've gone around the circuit, he ended up too close to the runway, too high to make a a sensible landing so I and we were about a hundred feet by this time so I said no go around again he opened up to full throttle and the left engine stopped so we got wheels down air brake out all the blow coming now out of one engine uh, and one not very powerful engine uh, it caught him by surprise unsurprisingly the airplane starts to veer off the runway uh, heading so the option of planting it on the runway and hoping for the best had gone uh, we're going slower and slower and slower uh, there was although he got the wheels up and the air brake in there was no way this airplane was going anywhere but down so the only option was Martin Baker let down uh, I'm in the back my straps are very loose because I've been trying to lean forward and look around his seat see what's going on in the front so I called eject eject uh, and I pulled the handle uh, and off we went uh, very loose shoulder straps, so I roll forward like this. Um, wake up, coming down in a parachute. I see my feet like that, thinking, "Well, oh, that's a strange view, isn't it? It's the airfield." <laughs> we arrive. No attempt at uh, a proper parachute uh, uh, landing. Ow! That's very painful. Well, first thought is, well, I get the Martin Baker tie now. <laughs> yes. Second thought is, ah. If I can get my personal locator beacon out and operate it, the manufacturer will give me a really nice solid silver beer mug. So I think I've got to get this bloody thing out. I'm about as far away from the control tower as we are now. And of course, all this has been witnessed by everybody. And uh, I'm lying there on the ground trying to get my PLB out when the safety services arrive. And I, if you'll excuse the language, bugger off. I haven't got my PLB out. I do not wish to be rescued yet. And they said, don't worry, sir, we understand you're under a little bit of stress. We'll just, we'll just restrain you to stop you doing yourself any more damage. I never did get the beer mug. Oh, <laughs> so close. <laughs> so, Tom, how long did you spend in the Navy? Uh, essentially, uh, two years with 801 Squadron, and that includes the, uh, the conversion training, time on board. Uh, and then in the summer of 68, I left them, so 66 to 68 and then six months flying instruction course, flying instructor at Valley, and then May 1969 to December 1970. First of December 1970, that's when I jumped out. Yeah. Well, of course, that was one dead buccaneer. Uh, um, the pilot was okay, because he used the top handle. I'm now lying in Dr. Gray's hospital in Elgin with a badly buggered back, and uh, I didn't fly again for some three and a, three and a half months, which is the usual time that you right, you yeah. have to recover from. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of my time with the Navy. Although obviously, moving on as I did into the RAF's Buccaneer Force uh, and serving on the RAF's Operational Conversion Unit for no fewer than three separate tours, uh, I kept very much in touch with naval people coming through, and still have many naval aviator friends. Yeah. So we've obviously mentioned that you flew the Buccaneer with the RAF. Can you tell us what the main differences were to, uh, from flying the Buccaneer in the Navy to the RAF? Well, initially, of course, the only difference between a Navy Buccaneer and an RAF Buccaneer was the paint scheme, okay. literally. Wow. They took a bunch of Naval Buccaneers, repainted them in RAF colours, gave them to the RAF. Systems-wise and everything, no difference. I think the first major change 
uh, was an improvement to the back cockpit instrumentation mm -hmm. uh, and the invention by Bruff of what we call the bomb door tank. You've got the rotating door which goes through 180 degrees to expose four bombs and Bruff came up with this idea that you could scab on a, a large fuel tank on the outside of it which made no uh, difference to the aircraft's performance whatsoever, okay. none whatsoever. The door could still be rotated whether it was full, half full or empty of fuel and it could still carry four bombs on it and the bomb door tank was the first major physical change that occurred with the aeroplane. The rest of the weapon system really minor, minor improvements to the radar minor improvements to the Doppler system, not, not a great deal. Weapons to carry though, obviously that did improve. Uh, the retard tail came in for the thousand pound bomb. Uh, the red beard was replaced with a, a much smaller uh, British nuclear weapon uh, and we could carry two of them rather than one. And then the first major standoff weapon which we could uh, use was the Martel missile oh, yeah. in its two versions, the anti-radar version and the TV guided version. Only for use in the maritime role, no use over land. Um, but 12 Squadron, which I was on at the time, were the first, well, the, the first squadron to be equipped with the Martel. But when it worked, given its relatively primitive technology, it worked very well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so those were the first real major changes and then everything stayed pretty much the same until the 1980s, beginning of the 80s, when uh, British Aerospace Dynamics produced the Siegel missile, which was a big advance on the Martel. It was a fire and forget weapon, and it had a long, it was a sea skimmer, long range, you could carry four on a buccaneer. The key though is that you had to know exactly where you were when you launched it, exactly where you were, okay. and you had to know exactly where the target was. Well, that wasn't too much of a an issue because you got third-party targeting information mm -hmm. from uh, other aircraft but you didn't know where the hell you were over the sea the blue jacket Doppler was absolutely useless mm -hmm. so what they called a, 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 a minimal navigation systems upgrade was introduced whereby the uh, the blue jacket Doppler was replaced by an inertial platform okay. the same sort of platform I think uh, as the Fin 1064 platform that we had in the Jaguar uh, and uh, that gave the navigator accurate navigational information so you could launch the missiles knowing where you launched them from because you were way back from the target uh, and the missile would know where to go. The only other physical change to the Buccaneer was that after the Rib 80 failure at Nevada during Red Flag uh, it was discovered that the extended wingtips of the Mark II uh, were generating uh, fatigue where they hadn't really expected it and uh, so they took off the wingtips so okay. if you see a Mark II Buccaneer now in a museum the, the wingtips are Mark I style. Well Tom it sounds like you had a great time on the Buccaneer but how many hours did you get? I got about 2,400 hours on the Buccaneer. That's quite a lot isn't it? <laughs> and then add on to that over a thousand hours in the two-seat Hunter in support wow, really? of Buccaneer flying. Wow. Uh, uh, I didn't realise you got that many hours yeah. in a uh, hunter, but yeah, briefly explain what was a hunt like to fly? I heard everyone loves it. Who lovely, flew it. lovely aeroplane. Yeah. Uh, completely different to the Buccaneer. It was a much lighter aeroplane, it's only got one engine for a start. Yeah. Um, but a beautiful, very light aeroplane and uh, a great fun to fly. So Tom, can we ask you some personal questions? Yeah. So, uh, do you have any hobbies? Do I have any hobbies? Sailing? Selling, well. A small yacht, rather elderly yacht, 20 years or more old, uh, which I look after. Uh, I have a golden retriever dog that requires walking regularly. <laughs> I do quite a lot of writing for the aviation magazines, aeroplane, aviation historian, that sort of thing. I've written a couple of books and uh, I will make my grandchildren model aeroplanes whenever they need them. <laughs> What's your favourite aircraft you have flown? That's a very difficult question to answer truthfully. Um, I think from the pure flying point of view, forgetting any operational aspect, the Hunter F6. Wow. It's a glorious aeroplane. I did a tour on the Hunter at Broadie 
The Hunter F6 was absolutely lovely. It went like a rocket. It was single seat. You were there on your own. No intercom noise or anything like that. Absolutely delightful aeroplane. Um, but it, even in its heyday, it was pretty useless as an operational <laughs> aeroplane. Yeah. Overall, though, uh, in terms of operational effectiveness and, and a delight to fly, it has to be the Buccaneer. Yeah. has to be the Buccaneer. Of course. Is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown that you didn't manage to? Is there an aircraft I wish I could have flown? Uh, having been OSI examining wing, I flew virtually everything in the Air Force. Um, I think I would love to have flown the F-16. Oh, wow. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so this is from Alexander Vata. I'm quite curious about the tactics and weaponry which they used against surface ships in the Sea Eagle era. Were they planning and of course training to use just iron bombs, maybe in conjunction with unguided rockets? No. The Sea Eagle era, if you were going to attack a major Russian warship or surface action group, you wouldn't plan to go in close and use iron bombs and uh, and rockets and that sort of thing. Uh, you would use the Seagull, which you could launch from more than 50 miles away, beyond the horizon. So the first knowledge that the enemy would have of the missiles coming was as they came in over the horizon at about five feet above the sea. <laughs> if you were going for a less heavily defended target, or if you'd run out of Seagulls, or whatever, we still had an accurate uh, delivery option in terms of uh, pave spike guided, laser guided bombs. Okay. Tossing the bombs from low level, uh, we, using the pave spike laser designation pod, but the disadvantage of that was that you had to get within about three miles of the target. Oh, that's quite close. And that's <laughs> too close. Yeah. So in the, to answer the gentleman's question, in the Sea Eagle era, if you could use Seagull, you wouldn't think of using close-in weapons. You'd only use what I would call close-in weapons when, you got n when you've got no other option. Right. And even then, you would not... We'd stopped using rocket pro projectiles long, long ago. Yeah. Uh, you would only use laser-guided bombs, which you could throw at them from about three and a half miles. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question to that um, from the same gentleman was, was there a different approach to it between the Royal Navy and RAF, or did Number 12 Squadron adopt the Navy tactics? We, we developed our own tactics on, on 12 Squadron, principally because the limitations of operations from a carrier simply didn't exist. Uh, we could launch as many aircraft as we wanted to. So in the, in the 70s, when I was on 12 Squadron, before we had precision guided weapons, we would launch formations of up to eight aircraft in two four ships to do combined toss and, and dive attacks on, on warships. You couldn't do that from a ship. You'd very unlikely ever have eight of your aircraft serviceable, available to fly. Yeah. All the, the limitations of size on the carrier meant that the Navy's tactics were by and large built around four aircraft. Okay. We could expand that mm -hmm. uh, and we use the basic pattern of the eight aircraft attack uh, to develop into six aircraft attack using Martel, uh, six aircraft attack at night using Leapers flares, this sort of thing. So the building block was the eight aircraft attack profile that we developed on 12 Squadron in the middle 70s and even at the end of the Buccaneers life with using uh, Seagull, where you'd want to disperse the threat axis as much as you could and bring the missiles in from as wide a range of options. The, the basic building block was still the, 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 effectively the six aircraft attack with a sort of split to a firing position so that everything's yeah. coming in from different sectors. So Tom, overall did you enjoy your flying career? Absolutely.